Welcome to Sunrise today. We're so happy that you decided to be with us. Thank you for joining us here live through your phone, your computer, um, just your TV, <laughs> however you're watching today. Um, let's start with a prayer today. Lord, we come before your presence and we want to tell you that we love you. We love you with all of our hearts. Thank you for everything that you do in our lives, Lord. I just thank you so much for life. I thank you for health, Lord. I thank you for providing for each family, Lord. Thank you because you are truly good. You're amazing. You're awesome. Thank you for the things that sometimes we don't notice, but they also come from you. Lord, today we want to focus on you. We want to dedicate you this time. This is your time, Lord. I just pray that you would be with us, that your presence would be felt in this place, uh, wherever all the people watching are, that your presence would be felt in that place, Lord. <clears throat> we love you, we bless you, and we want to worship you with all of our hearts. We pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen. We're going to go ahead and worship God. So. We invite you to join us. If you're able to clap, if you're able to sing, if you're able to stand, whatever you feel comfortable with. Oh.
in control. Man, that just makes me feel good. <laughs> to know that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, He is in control of my life because I am His child. Man, I receive peace right now in Jesus' name. I'm not going to worry because He is in control. And I always say this, one thing is to sing a song, right? And another thing is to believe it. And my prayer, my encouragement for you today is that you would believe every word that you are singing. That as you tell God, you are in control, steadfast, and movable. Nothing is impossible. You reign. As you sing and as you worship, that you would actually believe those words. Amen. Let's continue.
me sing. His face shines brighter than the sun. His grace as boundless as His love. He Will break. 
mountains bow down at the name of Jesus. first when I first came to Christ and I started to go to church there is a lot of fear in my heart and I remember that my friends who were all going to church they would say Chico whenever you're feeling that way I was younger I was like 12 13 whenever you're feeling that way call on the name of Jesus and they would tell me, demons flee at the name of Jesus. Nothing can touch you. The name of Jesus is super powerful. And I remember any time before bed or whenever I felt those negative feelings, I would say, Jesus. And I would just feel like a power that would just take over the room. And it might sound crazy to some of you, but I think for some of us that have been maybe through depression or through anxiety or different things like that, man, there is power in the name of Jesus. And I don't tell you because somebody told me. I tell you because I have experienced it myself. There are amazing promises. There are amazing things waiting for us in Jesus. Will we grab a hold of them today? You know, I invite you. I invite you to worship with all your heart. The times that we're going through right now, man, they just make you want to grab a hold of God. They just make you want to get closer to God with everything that's happening. Isn't it beautiful that we can come to the altar, we can come to Christ and say, Jesus, 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 the name above all names. Jesus, 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 we love you. Jesus, flow in my heart. Jesus, flow in my family. Jesus, flow on our kids. Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue to worship God. And with this last song, I just want to invite you. I just really feel it in my heart very strongly today. I feel like there is like something that is pushing us down. And this might not apply to everyone, but I just feel like there is a weight that you're, you've just been carrying. Maybe it's things you've been hearing. Maybe it's negativity. Maybe it's a loss in your family. I invite you today to just bring it to Jesus. Come to the altar and come, to, spiritually speaking, come to the altar. Lay it down at his feet. Wherever you're at, if you're watching this right now, just give it to Jesus right now. Come to his feet and say, God, I, I can't. I can't do this. I'm, I'm not capable. I'm not, it's not possible for me. But you can. And I grab a hold of the name of Jesus right now. is called 
speak to us. We lift up our hearts to you. We are your vessels, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 There's no greater place to be than at the feet of Jesus. He's always there with his arms wide open to receive us. Well, I'm Pastor Dean, and this is Sunrise Community Fellowship, and we are glad that you are with us, and we are glad that you are here. And uh, today we are in week three of our series, As the Day Approaches. And uh, my whole purpose for this sermon series is that I don't want any of us to be deceived and miss out on all that God has for us. There are so many messages out there, so many people trying to distract us in all different kinds of ways, and it's very easy to get caught up in all these things. And so... God has prepared amazing things for us as children. And Jesus said in Matthew uh, 24, right before his return, he says, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. See, unfortunately, this is what will happen to those who are not prepared. So in this series, this has been kind of our faith statement. This is what we've been looking at um, to kind of keep us focused here is let us not allow our present crisis to determine our spiritual posture. And it's a faith statement, and we've talked about this and about what posture is and, and having your spine aligned. And, but a spiritual posture is when we, first of all, believe deeply in our hearts that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and our Deliverer. That no matter our circumstances, no matter what's going on around us, that we can focus on and follow Jesus. See, because when we focus on and follow Jesus, our stress is turned into hope, and our frustration is turned into anticipation. See, Jesus is lifting us up right now, but he will return someday and lift us up to be with him in eternity. See, we can trust that he is at work in and all around us in our lives. Even though we don't see it sometimes, we don't recognize what he's doing. His promises are always true, and so he's always by our sides. So spiritual posture says we must develop consistent spiritual growth habits. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul said, Jesus died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Well, why? Why should we live for Christ and not for ourselves? Well, Paul warns us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 
Verse 2 says, such teachings come through hypocritical liars. But we know that Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 that when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, the Holy Spirit that comes in us and fills us, he will guide us into all truth. See, the problem is, is a lot of people don't think or don't realize that there is a battle going on for our souls. The enemy is fighting as hard as he can to take control of our lives. But Jesus Christ, out of his love for us, he already showed and displayed that by dying on the cross for you and for me. So the last two weeks we've looked at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 29, at the importance of developing and maintaining consistent spiritual growth habits and also the consequences of not having them. God's Word is uh, guiding us into all truth and preparing us for Christ's return. As believers in Christ Jesus, we not only have personal responsibility to God, but a responsibility in this relationship that we have with Jesus. To love Him, to be encouraged by Him, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in His Word, to listen to that still small voice that speaks into our lives. See, his mission is for us to reach others. We're to disciple them. We're to prepare people for works of service to build the kingdom of God. See, we just read 1 Corinthians 5 that says, we are not to live for ourselves, but for Christ. Well, we ended the service last week by repenting, making sure that our hearts were right with God. See, we're deceived if we deny that we have any sin. The Bible tells us that all have fallen short have, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we know that, that it's so important for us to repent. See, we are only justified and forgiven by one person, and that's Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. See, the word repent means to turn and go the other direction. It means to quit following the direction you're on, quit going down the road you're on, and turn and go a different direction. Paul tells us in Acts chapter 3, he says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, and that is Jesus. So as we continue this journey that we're on, we're going to talk today about the preparation for Jesus' second coming, and we're going to talk about the believer's duty. If you've ever read First Thessalonians, we see that Paul is trying to prepare the people for Christ to return again. As a matter of fact, that's one of his themes there. He didn't get to spend as much time in Thessalonica as he wanted to in his first missionary journey there. And so there was a lot of conflict and a lot of doubt that was going on. So he sent this letter to encourage those new believers and encourage the people that were there. So we pick up in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. It says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. See, Christ followers are to be different. Christ followers are to be different. See, the pagan world operates on a philosophy which does evil in spite of good. In other words, they will take advantage of you or use you just to get what they want. Or another thing, another philosophy is that, well, I'll only go, do good to people who do good to me. But that's not what Jesus tells us to do. In Luke 6, 33, he says, And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? See, even sinners do that, he said. See, the Christian is to live under a different standard. We are to do good to everyone even those who do evil to us. Now, I don't want you to know that's very difficult. As a matter of fact, that is hard for us in our natural selves, a natural man or natural woman for us to do that. When someone hurts us, when someone betrays us, when someone goes that extra mile to cause us pain, it's hard for us to forgive them. But we know that with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the strength of God, that we can do all things. And so we can accomplish this and, and people need to see the light of God flowing through us. See, that's the problem with going along with the world or having one foot in the world and one foot into God. We tend not to really be any good to anyone. 
Jesus said that people will know that you're mine by your love. He also told us that people will be able to recognize you by your fruit. Either you bear good fruit or you bear bad fruit. Verse 16 through 18 says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, again, this is our spiritual posture. This is the outcome of consistent spiritual growth habits. But I want you to know that by being joyful doesn't always mean being happy. To be joyful doesn't always mean to be happy. But it does mean that we live in a certain hope, a certain assurance that God has our back, that no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening in our lives, Jesus is going to see us through it. We see in James uh, chapter 1, he tells us to consider it pure joy when you face trials. Now, I want you to know that it's not happiness when we face trials. You know, it's even hard to be joyful, but it, it's not a joy that maybe excites us, but it's a joy to know that we have hope, that God is at work in and around us. And, and when we're in those situations, those are the times that we need to pause for a moment. Those are the times when we need to say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? What do I need to learn? How do you want me to change? Because, see, we don't like to admit it, but a lot of times, before God can take us to the next step or move us forward, we need to change something in our life. We need to submit to Him. And then Paul is telling us here that we need to live in an attitude of prayer. You know, with, with a relationship, there has to be communication. We talked about last week about, you know, a, a couple that got married and then the wife lived in one house and the husband lived in the other house. I mean, how does that work? I mean, it wouldn't be very long until that relationship would not be any good. Well, same thing with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to spend time in prayer, but not only speaking things, but we need to listen. We need to listen again to that still, small voice. It's so important. Another thing that gives us hope is that um, we don't need to complain. We just need to pray. We don't need to worry. We just need to pray. We don't need to stress over things. We just need to pray. Paul tells us to not worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God your needs, and don't forget to thank Him for His answers. And so that's what this last part is about, giving thanks in all circumstances. Now, I know, again, it's tough when circumstances are not good. Even what's going on right now, we feel like that our freedom has been taken away. There's some things that are tough. We know that, that we don't always exactly agree with everything, but we know that we're in a position where we have to just trust God. Because no matter, again, the circumstances, he will see us through it. So giving thanks in all circumstances is a major faith step. It's hard, but we can, again, do it with the help of Jesus Christ. Verse 19 and 20 says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. So, again, as we look at these passages, we have to put them kind of all together here and see what Paul is doing and the direction he's taking us. But see, if you're joyful always and praying continually and giving thanks in all circumstances, then you won't quench the Spirit of God. He's telling us, don't quench the Spirit of God. And so what does that mean? Well, quenching the Spirit of God is putting in, taking the focus off of God and putting it on yourself. Anytime that you're acting out in selfishness, anytime you're feeling sorry for yourself, anytime you're putting others down to try and make yourself look good, Anytime you're exaggerating the truth, anytime that you're, you know, pushing someone away or, or not being compassionate to somebody, you're quenching the Spirit. This happens in our homes. This can happen at work. This can happen in the church. You know, none of us are perfect, but it's so important for us to, to again, see God and to, to, to experience that. As Chico was talking about, when you call on the name of Jesus, you experience something that is unique. I mean, you can't explain it with words. You just have to experience it. He loves us so much that he wants us to experience everything he has for us. So we need to be excited to worship and serve God. And verse 20 here is talking about, Paul is talking about prophecies that come from the Word of God. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. See, there's a lot of people, and even today, people that prophesy this and prophesy that, and they, some people will go out on a limb and they'll say, well, God told me to tell you this, and God told me to tell you that. 
Well, I want you to know that if it's not in line with God's Word, don't believe it. See, that's why he said in verse 21, test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. See, don't just believe what people are telling you. I mean, people will tell you all kinds of things to manipulate you. So don't believe what people are telling you. Don't be taken in and don't be misled to support something that doesn't honor God or that's not of God. We know today more than ever, and it really makes me mad, you know, because my parents are senior adults, that when people call them on the phone or send them emails or something and try and deceive them just to get money, they try and, you know, tell them that this is a cause or, or you know, people have been called by someone that, and say, this is your grandson or granddaughter, and I'm sick, I'm in the hospital, send me money. Unfortunately, people take advantage of people all the time, and it's not right. And so we can be misled in all kinds of different ways. But we are blessed, especially in America, more than ever before, is because we have the Word of God available to us. Uh, Pew Research says that there's 4.1, I don't know how you do that, or 4.2 Bibles in every home in America. I'm sure a lot of them are dusty. They need to be dusted off, but... But we can test the information that we get against God's Word. See, this is so important because the closer we get to Jesus' return, deception will increase. I mean, we already see that deception is on the rise. There's a lot of things that are spoken, even things in the news. We can't verify that are accurate. We know that the people are motivated as they share stuff by different reasons. News, you know, the, all the news broadcasts, they're motivated by ratings. Because the higher the rating, the more they can sell commercials. You know, I'm sure there's truth in what they, sh they share, but we also know that they like to build anxiety, so you tune in again next week. And so we've got to be careful about what we listen to and what we believe. Because the only real truth we have to hold on to is the Word of God. That's why we need to know it. We need to memorize it. We need to study it. We have to realize that it's our most powerful weapon. Paul tells us it's the only offensive weapon we have, the sword of the Spirit, in Ephesians chapter 6 when he talks about the armor of God. And then we need to avoid every kind of evil. Anything that doesn't bring glory to God, we need to run from it. And there's, Satan is so good at deceiving and manipulating and making things look like, well, that's not so bad. But if it takes the place of your relationship with God, if it's not in God's Word, if it's just sidestepping God's expectations for our life, then we know that it's not of God and we need to run from it. So verse 23 is really the heart of what Paul is saying in these passages here. He says, May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying here is that when Jesus comes again and when we're going to stand before the great white throne of judgment, that we can be found blameless. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's, that's awesome. I mean, I'm excited about that because, again, our nature is sin. You know, we were born into sin. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of the blood that he shed, the sacrifice that he made, we can be found blameless. That we can be in 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 uh, in place with God. Man, I almost messed that up. This is the result of the believer's proper behavior. See, God has given us his expectations. See, let's look at how we can experience the encouragement that we get from this passage of Scripture. First, the believer experiences the presence of God, the God of peace. You know, I don't know about you, but I love peace. You know, there's times in our life when something happens, someone that we love passes away or some, tra some tragedy happens. And God is the only one that can give us peace to our souls. As a matter of fact, the definition of peace is to be bound, joined, or weaved together. See, it's only God that can bind, join, and weave a person together. Only God can bring peace to a person's soul. The kind of peace that brings absolute assurance confidence and security to a person's heart. Only God can do that. The second thing that we can learn is that the believer experiences sanctification. The word sanctification means to be set apart and separated to God. Not away from Him, but to Him. 
See, God takes the surrendered person and sets them apart unto him. It's a special relationship. It's a deeper walk with him. It happens when we get to that point, that crisis in our life, when we don't want to be fake, that we don't want to just have one foot in the world and one foot into God. We consecrate ourselves to him. And the cool thing about that is this cleansing power of the Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out. See, that's why, as we talked about a little bit last week also, that why God sent Jesus Christ, because this relationship with Jesus, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, only true transformation happens from the inside out. And we needed that as a people, as a world, so that we could be in the presence of God. Simply put, I don't know how to put it any other way, it's the difference between being a Sunday Christian and a 24-7 Christian. See, we are to be the person who no longer lives for themselves, but for Jesus. Who no longer lives for themselves, but for Jesus. We are to be a light to the world. We're to be Jesus' hands and feet. If we don't live for Jesus, who's going to get to know him? If we don't tell someone about Jesus, how are they going to know? If we don't share the love of Jesus with other people, how are they going to experience it? It's all up to us to do that. Number three, the believer has spirit, soul, and body preserved blameless in the day of judgment. As I said before, man, what a great blessing that is. But we could never do this on our own. It's only through Christ's sacrifice on the cross that we can be acceptable to God and receive his full reward. Spirit, soul, body, our whole being being made blameless. Only through a relationship with Jesus. And again, that's why God sent him on our behalf. The fourth thing is the believer experiences the assurance of God, the very fullness of God. See, God completes his work in us. The work of salvation from beginning to end. If we allow him, God continues to work in the person until the person is fully saved in the glorious day of redemption. And so what that is, is that's when we leave this place, this earth, and we get our glorified bodies and we get to be in heaven. We get to experience the glorification of God. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. Just praising and worshiping our God and getting to experience the glory of God and all He's provided for us. See, all these, have been, all these things have been revealed to us in Scripture. But the question for us is, will we walk in obedience to receive the crown of of eternal life forever. See, there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that say, if you do this and if you do that. See, it's, it's not that our salvation is by works, but once we receive that free gift of salvation, then we want to, through our life, through what God has done for us, to serve Him, to live for Him, to be obedient to His Word. We do it out of love, the love that we have for Him because He loved us first. And then verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. See, Paul's confidence rests in the nature and character of God. Our confidence rests in the nature and character of God. Last week, we studied Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, and I kind of want us to make that our prayer today. Lord, help us Hold unswervingly to the hope we pro- profess. For you, God, who promised is faithful. See, the real issue for us today, in the circumstances that we're in right now, is that we cannot afford to lose our hope, we can't afford to lose our peace, and we can't afford to lose our faith. And that's what this world, that's what the enemy, that's what he's trying to do, is he's trying to take your hope, your peace, and your faith away from you. But Jesus sacrificed himself. Jesus already has done battle with the enemy. The enemy has no control over us, only what we allow him to have. And so last week we ended the service with repenting, and this week I just want to encourage you as we end the service to just pray for wisdom. Because there's so much deception, so many things that are going on right now, I just want to encourage you to pray for wisdom from God. And we know that the first place that we get that is through His Word, and then as we pray and as we listen to Him. But He will give us wisdom. He will allow us to see things that we don't normally see. 
He will allow us to see when deception is trying to happen to us. But we've got to be connected to Him. It's real important. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today, and we are grateful for your amazing love. We're grateful for that hope and that peace that you could only give. And Lord, today we pray for that wisdom. Your word tells us to pray for wisdom, and that you grant wisdom. And so we pray for wisdom to be able to see through the schemes of the enemy, to see the deception that's around us. Lord, I pray that we would hold on to your truth, that we would hold on to your love. Because we know it's the only thing that's really real, is your love for us because you've already proved it to us. Again, Lord, I pray your hand of protection upon each and every one of us, Lord, that all those in families that are represented, Lord, that you would keep them safe from the virus, Lord, that we would continue to pray and uplift our first responders and our law enforcement. Lord, there's a lot of crazy things going on right now, and we just pray, Lord, that you would watch over and protect each and every one. And Lord, that we would come back to being a nation under you, that we would focus on you and allow you to guide us and direct us on this journey that we're on. Lord, we love you and thank you for everything that you do for us. In your son Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, next week we're going to be uh, diving into some more details from Scripture about Jesus' return. We're going to talk about some ways that you can uh, not be deceived from Scripture. And then we're going to talk about some of the benefits uh, that we have as a believer when Jesus returns again. So I just want to encourage you to tune in again next week or be here next week. And I'm just thankful for what God has done in our lives and what he continues to do. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living.